thank goodness it's Friday. Happy Friday. This point on today's date is free. Um, mostly because, you know, some days are busier than others, and some days are not. And even writing the quiz for today was a bit of a task. And some of you really tried your hardest to ask questions during office hours, which is fine and great. It just means that the quiz was shorter than normal for everyone. Uh, could have been that there was no quiz, but mm, you should have asked more questions. <laughs> anyway, so today um, we're talking about section 3.3, 3.4, which is a new rule called the chain rule. Um, perhaps a better phrase would be rule for derivatives of functions which have been composed. Composed functions. Does anyone recall the basic idea of composition of functions? That's okay. Yes? Um, it's written down with two functions and then you put one in for the x and the other one. Beautiful. Paraphrase when. One function, and by that I think we mean functions output is the input to another function. Beautiful. You said when one function is plugged into the next, right? So the first function, you give some number, it does something to that number and gives out something. Then you plug that into the next function, which does something to that input and gives you something else. So I, I remember drawing diagrams about things like, let's say, 1. We apply a function to 1, and that gives us 6. And then we take that, we do some other function to 6 now, and that gives us, I don't know, 36, something else. This is a composition of functions. And we give a name, or a special symbol, to this process which now associates in this manner, applying F and then applying G. We give a name to the function, which is this composition of functions, and that is G circle F, or G composed with F. A little quick example, because I think perhaps, based on that first question, we should add like composition functions to this Christmas list. Um, what if uh, F of X has a rule to it. It says take the input and just add 3 to it. And then I give you another function, h. And, and this rule is, well, we're going to square the input. What happens if I take the function f and I plug in the whole function h to it? This has the name f composed h when you plug in x. So in this writing. Yes? Okay, well, we take the function h, which is x squared, and that's the input for the function f. The function f says, take your input and add 3 to it. Here's my input from h. Add 3. That's the result. 
So first I plug something into H, it gives me X squared. That output, which is X squared, I plug into F. So it's X squared plus 3. What about H of F of X? In these types of symbols, we would term this H composed with F of X. Right, doing things in the opposite order. First, doing the function f to an input, and then doing the function h to the output of that. So I think of it from the inside out, or in this notation, from the right to the left. First, what does f do to our input? f takes the number and adds 3. This is f of x. That becomes the input to H. H says for the input, you square it to get the output. Here's our input, we need to square it. So this whole thing is squared. Right? Okay. Do we need more of these? You can do all sorts of fun little crazy things, like plugging a function into itself over and over again. In computer science, you call this recursion. The input to a function is the function itself. And so long as there's some base case, you can resolve the whole thing. First, we evaluate this from the right to the left. First thing we do is we ask, well, we plug in x to the first one. What does that give us? Right? That gives us this. Then we take that and we plug it into the next one in the list. So that's why it's inside this parentheses. So what is g of g of x? So I'll write this one down step by step. We're plugging in to this second one the result of plugging in x to g, which, as described here, is the square root of x. g, again, just says take your input and square root it. So here's my input. We're going to square root that input. No matter what the input is, whatever it is, x says just square root. The input is already a square root because that's what the output of g was, so we just square root the square root. This is a nice handy way, you can do this over and over and over again. It's a nice handy way of getting even roots. This is x under a fourth root. Because we remember if we have an nth root, that's the same as x to the 1 over n. And I hope we also remember that x to the a to the b is equal to x to the a times b. So here we have x to the 1 half. That's the square root of x raised to the one half power, which is x to the one fourth power, or the fourth root of x. This tells you to find any even root. You just need to know how to find a square root efficiently. Keep doing roots, square roots over and over, and you'll get the even root you're looking for. 
or at least powers of two. <laughs> There's some field theory for you. Field extension theory for you. Questions about composition? Okay. So this is, this is the question for today. We've learned how to take derivatives of quotients. We've learned how to take derivatives of products. We've learned how to take derivatives of natural exponentials. We've learned how to take derivatives of polynomials and constants. And we have these fancy rules for them, known as the quotient rule, the constant rule, the product rule, the ex natural exponential rule, the polynomial power rule. The next rule is for this kind of function. What if we've got some function plugged into another, and we want to take the derivative of that? That's the chain rule. That's what it's good for. So kind of like last time, I'm going to hold off, unless you really want to see it, I'm going to hold off on the proof of it, and we're just going to go through loads and loads of examples. <coughs> that seemed to be better last time. I'm getting a lot of yeses. No audible yeses today. Okay, that's okay. So, huh? Yes? Oh, you're good? Yeah. Sorry. No problem. Never need to be sorry for taking care of yourself. Never, never, never. Okay, people. Right. Yes, lots of functions and lots of derivatives. More. Yes, here we go. Um, so, uh, hmm. let's take a really simple example. Um, the simplest example I can I can honestly think of would be a power function. You can already do this. What is the derivative of x to the e? is also the same as x squared to the fourth, right? You agree? Based on that multiplication rule we looked at before. Well, that doesn't look like x to the eighth anymore. This looks like a composition of functions. To me, at least. I take x squared and I plug it in, I plug it into x to the fourth. Okay. You see that? x to the eighth is the same as g of f of x, which means evaluate f at x gives us x squared. Plug that into g, which says raise that to the fourth power. Chain rule says if f and g are differentiable functions and compose nicely, Compose nicely. You, you remember there's problems with like, you can't always plug a function into another function. You have to worry about domains, right? What if, what if we have a root here, an even root, and the output of f is only negatives? They don't compose nicely in that case. So I want to write a lot of technical jargon here, like stuff like that. But if f and g are differentiable and compose nicely, is is sufficient. In other words, we don't need to worry about this composition actually being defined or working well. Then, here's the, here's the kick. The derivative with respect to x of f of g of x is 
f prime of g. That's g composed into the derivative of f times the derivative of g. Now I'm mixing prime and, and Leibniz notation here. I hope that's okay. I'm going to write this in words over here just so we can... another way. In other words, camera still more or less pointed in the right way. In other words, function composition has this kind of like inner and outer idea. There's a function that gets plugged in, and there's a function that's really on the outside. Right? There's an inner function that gives the first result, and the outer function takes that result. So sometimes it's, it's referred to in this way. Given an inner function, g, and an outer function, f, the derivative of this composition is the derivative of the outer, okay, the derivative of the outer, that's f prime, of the inner, Function, so you're still composing that in, you're still putting it in there. Is clear? The derivative of the outer function still composed with the original inner function. So of means composed with. Times. The derivative of the inner. Just in sort of in words. Back to this example. What's my inner function? Just like in the quotient rule, the identification of these functions is most of the battle. Then what you do is you just make a sort of a chart of these derivatives. F prime, 2x. G prime, 4x cubed. And then you plug things together. <coughs> G of f of x prime is derivative of the outer function f prime of, uh, that's different in this case. I switched up my f's and g's. The outer function here is g. Derivative of the outer function which is four 
x to the third. This is g prime here of the inner function times the derivative of the inner function. Labeling these guys. Times the derivative of the inner function. And all together, what is that? Eight x to the 6th times x, which is 8x to the 7th. This is a terrible way to think about derivatives of power functions. Absolutely horrendous. But it's probably the easiest example we have. Something that you know the derivative of, and something that we can easily apply the chain rule to before it gets messier. Identification first. I'm going to give you just an example here. I want you to think about what's the inner function and what's the outer function. And I want you to sort of make this table on the right then. I'll give you some function, say, e to the x squared. And I want you to write down what is our inner function. Is that what I used over here? I used g as the inner. So think about what is the outer function. And what is the inner function? And then, once we've confirmed that you know those, then we can write down the rest of the table. F prime, G prime, and then we'll fill in the chain rules expression. If you had this, then I would agree wholeheartedly with you. I'm taking e to the x, and instead of plugging in x, I'm going to plug in x squared. So the x becomes an x squared. In this way, we've got f of g of x equals f of x squared equals e to the x squared. G says, given a number, we're going to square it. F says, given a number, we're going to take the exponential e to that number. The number that f receives has been modified. F gets the modification of the original input by g, and g squared it. So now this is our input into f, and f says whatever this is, we're going to take the input and use it as the power of our natural base. Okay? Did anyone have different inner and outer functions? Because you can. Not as simple in the end, but did anyone? Flipped you flipped them? Inner and outers? You mean like this was x squared and this was e to the x? And then you wrote it like this, g of f instead. Fine, we just switched names. That's all we did. Did someone, did I see another hand? Yeah. Yeah, um, how do you know when you're looking at the uh, e to the x squared, like that's not the derivative and you're looking for like the, the original? Oh goodness, this is, you know that because this is not calculus 2. <laughs> calculus 2 
calculus one, you're usually given a function and you're asked to find derivatives. The inverse problem, which is difficult, is calculus two. Given a derivative or given some function, find the function which gives you the derivative that you already have. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have functions and we go to derivatives. Calc 1. Calc 2. Slash n of calc 1. It's a huge smile underneath this mess. You can see. <laughs> Be a good time. Questions about inner and outer identification of in this problem? No? Here we go then. What's the derivative of f? Thank you, yes, yes. G? 2x. Good, this should be pretty fast by now, I hope. So, the chain rule says, what is the derivative of f of g of x? It is the derivative of the outer, when you plug in the inner, times the derivative of the inner. We know most of these pieces now, right? We know all of them, actually. We know g prime of x. We know f prime is e to the x. So e to what power? We need to plug in g. Not g prime, just g. The original g. The original inner function. The og. That worked out well. That's it. That's all it is. Okay, next. What's the inner function? What's the outer function? Write them down. Outer function looks like the fourth root to me of just some input. What is the input? Looks like x squared plus 1. Things like roots or parentheses sometimes make inner and outer function distinctions more simple. If you've got parentheses around an entire expression, that's probably your inner function. And then the outer function is probably what's happening outside the parentheses. If you've got exponentials, that also makes a nice distinction because probably what's happening in the power is your inner function, and this space is the original outer function. Once we've got these, we just need to find derivatives, and then find the compositions, and go from there. F prime of x, this is x to the one-fourth, so we multiply by that one-fourth and subtract one from it which is 1 over 4 of the fourth root of x cubed, or honestly just leave it like this, if that's okay. g prime of x is 2x to the first plus 9. j 
chain rule says h prime is derivative of the outer composed with the original inner times the derivative of the inner. Derivative of the outer is 1 fourth x to the negative 3 fourths. But we're going to compose that with the original inner. So instead of writing an x, I'm going to write the entire inner function. Times the derivative of the inner. opportunity to perhaps um, maybe not. I'm going to take this opportunity to go into a little bit of the proof just to see how it went, but I don't think I think we'll just keep doing functions. given any composition which composes nicely and is differentiable individually, the derivative of the composition is always like this. x plus 1. If you follow the, the procedure we've done, you identify the outer, identify the inner, take derivatives of them, follow the formulaic procedure there at the end, you should come up with
questions on the one we just I let you out. Loose palm? Yeah. Get to the end. Yes? Right? What's the inner? What's the outer? But maybe this time, we can step it up a notch. Chain rule, given two differentiable functions which play nicely in composition. Right? Do these play nicely? Can I plug in the output of sine? Sorry, can I plug in the output of cosine into sine? Is that allowed always, sometimes, or never? Now you have to know about sine and cosine. What can sine take as input? What's the domain? Any real number, right? Any angle. I pick a point on the unit circle and it corresponds to going around the unit circle, some angle, either positive or negative. So, so long as cosine gives us a real number, we're good. They play nicely. Does cosine always give us a real number? Think about what it is. If I take a unit circle and pick a point on that unit circle, that corresponds to some angle t. The cosine of this angle is the x-coordinate of this point. Are all of the x-coordinates of points on this circle real numbers? Yes, they are. Right, this is on the plane. x here, y here. The x-coordinate is somewhere between this vertical line and this vertical line on this, so it's actually just a subset of the reals. Cosine can only output between negative one and one. All of those numbers are reals. So they play nicely. And we've stepped it up a bit to ask that question now. So now that we've said yes, they do. What is it? What's the inner, what's the outer? What are their derivatives? The outer is the sine. The inner is the cosine. It's what's being plugged into sine, so that makes it the inner. Their derivatives, you remember from last time, I hope? Cosine, or sine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Very good. Chain rule says we're going to take the outer's derivative, and we're going to plug in this. So cosine of cosine. That's the outer's derivative when you plug in the original inner function. It stays inside. But what then pops out in multiplication is the derivative of the inner. So the derivative is negative cosine of cosine of x times sine of x. Yeah, it's commutative. You know what I mean? Like 4 times negative 1 is no different than negative 4 times positive 1. So we'll just write it like that. Oh. So that the negative's in front. And we don't confuse it as minus. Like, you know what I mean? Cosine minus something. 
-hmm. Yeah, that helps avoid confusion. This next one I've given you is a bit of a troublemaker. Because it's not always well defined. Let me make it easy. Erase, erase. That's too that's, that's, that's There we go. There we go. Less troubling, yeah? Still troubling, but less. We've seen this before. It was the graph I looked at a lot earlier where it kind of does this thing. Like that. Where does it do that crazy thing? One X is not. Right away, the domain of our inner function is not everywhere. It's only well defined at everything but zero. But possibly of greater concern, close to zero, it gives values. One over x, close to zero, gives values that are either plus or minus infinity. Right? limit as x goes to 0 from the right of 1 over x, the limit as x goes to 0 from the left of 1 over x is what? Which one's which? Plug in numbers from the left, closer and closer to zero, this thing goes further and further down. That's this one. Plug in numbers from the right of zero, closer and closer to zero, and this graph gets taller and taller and taller. That's this one. Tell me, what is sine negative infinity, sine positive infinity? I don't know either. Okay, composition doesn't always play nicely, right? Big problem with composition. These are the things you need to worry about sometimes when working through this. How do you correct problems like this when applying the chain rule? You do as well as you can. This is true in any profession. You give exactly as much as you can. And you say specifically the situations where you don't know. So I can't say uh, I don't want to use F. Um, I can't say what um, we'll use H again. What H of zero is. So I can't say what h prime at 0 might be. But everywhere else, can you tell me what it is everywhere else? Everywhere else, composition behaves nicely. I don't get an infinity which I have to plug into sine. 
right? And if I plug in any real number to sine, I get a real number out. But infinity is a problem. So here we go. Inner and outer. I think I called this one F and this one G, right? Inner is 1 over x, outer is sine of x. Derivatives, cosine of x. Negative 1 over x squared. I take the derivative of the outer and I plug in the inner. And I multiply that by the derivative of the inner. I mean, this formula by itself kind of suggests. You still can't plug in zero. Right? So pressing on with the chain rule sometimes just gives you something that is obviously not defined somewhere. Sometimes it's less than obvious. So sometimes it's really good to analyze beforehand what you have, what you can and cannot do, and then explicitly say what you can and can't do. Ready for the hardest one of the day? Some of you are perking up right now, some of you are saying, Dear Lord, no. But there's like 12 minutes left. Surely it won't take us 12 minutes. It's the hardest one of the day. This one's actually really well behaved. Really well behaved. Go through the process. We've got a function. We need to know two things. Go ahead. Oh, okay. You're identifying an inner and an outer function. You're saying the outer one is three, right? And you're like, oh no, derivative is zero. Okay, For any, you're, you're on the exact right track. Let me stop you before you start taking derivatives. Do you see inner and outer functions? No. This looks like a function. That's what makes this one really hard. You have to cook up inner and outer functions. Suggestions? One, oh, that would be interesting. But when you compose functions with one, you either get one or you get the function at one. If you compose, and this is a general thing, actually. This is a really, this happens every time. Every time. I've made the same mistake. Let's say the outer function is 3 to the x, and the inner function is x. Okay? What is the outer of the inner? So this is f, this is g, what is f of g? Alright, it's the original function. 
it's literally f of x because g just gives x. If your composition doesn't break it down into something different, piece by piece, like this does not, it just identifies there is an x here, then the chain rule is not going to tell you anything. The chain rule says take the derivative of the outer, plug in the original, inner, right? Multiply by the derivative of the inner. What this is saying now is the, uh, the derivative of h is the derivative of h times 1. Okay. Right? So you cannot pick one of your functions to be just x. Okay, here we go. Let's gain some traction and take this apart. If your answer to this is no, I suggest you watch one of the lectures we did on 3.1. The answer should be yes. And which one do you want? Many lectures ago, I asked. We have a change of base formula for logarithms. Do we have a change of base formula for exponentials? I suggested back then we do, and that it might come in handy. Here we go. We're going to write this like this, so that we quite plainly get a composition of an inner and an outer function. And I suggest that we're going to know the derivative of both. Neither of them is going to be the identity. Neither of them is going to be a constant. But in order to do this, we need to remember something about inverses. If I take e to the natural log of some function, what is that? Uh, that's, an n, that's an n, not an x. What does that give me? The function. E raised to the natural log. These are inverses of each other. They completely undo. Plug in a function, the natural log does something. Plug that into the exponential, natural exponential. It completely undoes what the natural log did, so the function pops back out. This is the key. Bring the power down front. Outer and inner. What did we plug in to what? This is e to some power, right? So what are we plugging in? We're plugging in this power. And we're plugging it into e to the x. our outer, which I call F. This is our inner, which I call G all day. 
actually run out of time. I think where I flipped them. Hold on. You can differentiate both these now, right? And neither of them is one, right? This is the easiest derivative we've ever seen. It's itself. This one's actually pretty easy too. This is a number times x. So it's 1 times x to the 0 times that number. Right? Derivative of a constant times a function is the constant times the derivative of that function. This is just the number, natural log of 3. So this derivative. function composed with the original inner function times the derivative of the outer, or sorry, inner function outer function's derivative is the same as the outer function we plug in the original inner function to that. We just multiply by the derivative of the inner function. And from here, I'm just going to borrow this step right here, put in this direction. 3 to the x is the same as e to the x times natural log of 3. In general, this is a nice little theorem for us. If you have an exponential function b to the x, then Derivative of that is natural log of the absolute value of b times the original function. So what we have here, 3 was just a positive number, so this just turned into the natural log of 3 times 3 to the x. That's a fact. With the follow-up question. Why do we care about the absolute value? That is something you can think about all right. Class is over. I'll see you on Wednesday. You're welcome to come to class Monday. I won't be here. So, sorry. Have a good weekend.